Well, good morning, everybody. Let's stand for opening prayer, please. Dear precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for waking us this morning and giving us life again. We just invite your presence in here this morning. We say, come Holy Spirit of the living God. Come, move among your people this morning. Change hearts for you. Minister to those that know know you, Lord God. And we're going to give you all the praise and all the glory. In your precious name, amen. amen. All right, Sister Rhonda is going to come forward and lead us in song. Good morning. Page 736. 736. <laughs>
have a birthday. Sister Black, your son informed us that you turned 85 yesterday. So I believe Joey's incorrect about that, isn't it? All right, let's sing happy birthday to Sister Black. Happy birthday to you. Pray for our preacher this morning, for Reverend Wooten, as he brings the word that God's anointing be upon him. Continue to pray for the ledgers as they're away. And to continue to pray for Brother Jerome. He's got two services today and another, I think, week and a half on the road. So let's keep them in prayer and the lights that are with them. And Sister Mary's ill in the hospital? Yes, very ill. Very ill. Yeah, down very low. Okay. Let's pray for Sister Mary. I, those that don't know her, she's been here quite a lot, and she's been on the road for years with a Victory Trio, and uh, she uh, is a really special, sweet sister in the Lord. So let's ask the Lord to uh, intervene in her life and be there with her and uh, for the Lord's very best for her today and the days following. I want to continue to pray for... Uh, the people that are working in the office, Greg and Steve, yes. and you have to get them help. I want to pray for Daniel on the grounds and Rodney and all they have to do. Pray for the dining hall. Pray for Bob and security. I want to pray for each person here that has a job or a chore. Yes. Everything's just as important as the other. You know, the Bible talks about, the Lord talks about the body being important. One has to be the finger, one has to be the thumb. Each part is just as important as the other one, or the body can't function. So don't think because you're doing trays or you're doing dishes or sweeping the floor that it's a, a menial job. It, we don't have uh, clean trays to eat on unless somebody does it. Right. You know, we don't have clean tables to sit and eat at unless somebody does that. It's all very important for us to have life here as the Lord's given it to us, which is really a really good life here, isn't it? Yes. Does anybody have a prayer request this morning? Is that a prayer request for all the inmates that incarcerated? Also for the rest of the first responder and who's doing now, I'll see you up on their home. All right. Okay. I'd like to remind everybody to sign up sheets in the back if you want to sign up for the request of ministry and or donate. Nobody else has a prayer request? Well, I'd like some prayer. How about you all? All right, let's stand for prayer. Brother Doug, lead us in prayer, please. All right, the ushers are coming forward, and we'll take the morning offering, which goes towards the expenses of the mission.
Well, thank you for your giving this morning, and thank you as always for the offertory and your beautiful music today. Sister Rhonda is going to come forward and lead us in another song. Page 88. Let's open up our hearts this morning and see what the Lord has for each one of us. Well, thank the Lord for such love. It's magnificent, it's magnanimous, and it's manifold. Praise God forever. Thank the Lord for all that he does for each of us some of the things we don't even realize that he does. Reaching down, guiding our steps when we're not aware of it. Sometimes putting his arms around us and drawing us close and whispering in our heart how much he loves us. Brings us to a place where we can kneel down and pray and have fellowship with our Father. Such 
wonderful love. Well, look with me this morning in the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 19. Romans chapter 1. A wonderful, wonderful scripture this morning. Verse 16. Romans chapter 1. It's in the New Testament. Amen. All right. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Our Father, as we bow before you this morning, we thank you again for your blessed help. We thank you for the good singing this morning, how it stirred our hearts. We pray, Lord, now as we gather together just for a few minutes of hearing thy word, that thou will help us as we share together. Help us to be awake and alert, grasp those things that you would have especially for us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Looking over into the book of Hebrews, you can sit down now, Philip. Looking over in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we find the definition, the spiritual, scriptural definition of faith. And it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What a tremendous statement. I don't know how in the world the Hebrew writer came up with such a statement and such a definition of what faith is all about. But when we look at faith, we recognize that faith has many, many facets. You can't just sit down and say, this is faith, and classify that only as faith, for there are many, many aspects to it. You may develop one particular asset of that faith and be able to grow thereby and be able to experience a magnanimous, wonderful, wonderful experience of grace. Others may grasp and hold on to something else and be able to live thereby. And so we have many, many different aspects of faith. This morning I want to, with the Lord's help, just to be able to look at just two or three of them. I know I'm not going to be able to cover them sufficiently, but maybe enough to give a scratch on the surface so that you can then get down in that scratch and be able to itch and scratch yourself for what you want out of it. We find in the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 20, that the Jude writer said, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Keep that in mind as we go through, because that's basically what we do as we begin to progress. When we get to an opportunity of knowing God's salvation, the plan thereby, He gives us that faith. He opens that door for us to be able to step into. And when we step into it, then we recognize the justifying grace of Almighty God, the regenerating grace, praise God forever, the quickening power of the Holy Ghost in our life and our heart. And we see that God continues to help us to walk in the light. And as we continue in the light, and as we walk with Him, we begin to see the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. So we find here that we're starting out with a building block. We have to have a foundation, a good, firm foundation. That's where a lot of people fail. They don't get a good, firm foundation. Now, we can build our faith upon the church, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. The church is the organization that God instituted the day of Pentecost, and it began to move forward, and it had one purpose, and that was to exalt Jesus Christ and to lift him up and to preach him to a lost and dying world. What a wonderful, wonderful thought that was. But we see 
this morning that we can build our block upon the church and the church begins to drift. Even now the paradigm of the church has, has begun to move sideways or, or begin to splinter and to fall apart it seems like because people are relying too much on the church. We can build our, our faith upon the preacher, the pastor, upon the evangelist, our missionary. We can build it upon the workers, the deacons, and the Sunday school teachers, and the board members, and, and the youth directors, and all that. We can build our faith upon them. But they may fail us. They may crumble. They may fall. And what's going to happen to our building at that point? We can take our faith and we can build it up on our parents and our grandparents and upon their religion. And we can be tied to their apron strings and their apron strings of old fashioned salvation and walk away with God. Have a wonderful, wonderful experience of grace because we built it now on grandma's prayers and grandpa's scriptures and mother's prayers and daddy's guidance. And so we've taken that foundation and we begin to build on that block. But sometimes, once they die off, your faith dies off because you don't have anything then to rely upon. Because the faith now, the block is broken. We can also build our faith upon our own thoughts and our own beliefs and our own desires and our own purpose in life. We can say, well, this is the way I think it ought to be. This is the way I feel like it should be. And we cannot build our block up on feelings because feelings vacillate day by day. You get up today, you feel really, really good, you could conquer the world. Well, you could be like Napoleon and you could run through the whole world. You could be like all of those great conquerors of days gone by. You can be like Alexander and say the world's going to be mine and begin to parade yourself all the way to India. And when you finally get there, you'll find yourself broken. And you will too, because you've built your foundation of faith upon yourself, upon your own thinkings, your own desires, your own ambitions. What you thought was right. And it can be broken. But what we have to come to, friends, and listen to me carefully this morning, what we have to do is the first, the first cornerstone, the first building block has to be built upon Christ Jesus. We can't build on anything else because we'll be building on sand. We'll be building on sand. And he said, Jude said, for us to build up yourselves on your most holy faith. Well, let's look at that this morning just for a minute with the Lord's help. Faith. Faith is the only method of deliverance from condemnation. Now, a lot of people can try to get out from underneath condemnation every way possible. You can try to reason your way out from underneath it. Well, I'm not as bad as he is. I'm not as bad as she is. I didn't, I didn't do near as bad as my brother did. I didn't do near as bad as my daddy did. And so we find ourselves here trying to realize the condemnation's not there because I say it's not there. But it doesn't change the fact there's a heaviness because you're carrying a load. You're carrying a tremendous load of guilt and shame on your heart. And we can try to reason it away. We can go to a counselor. We can talk to a counselor and, and let them tell us, you're a good boy. You're a good man. Let me pat you on the back. Let me, let me build you up. Let me put the pump to you and pump you up really good so you can go away feeling wonderful. But it doesn't change. You go away and you're as heavy as you were because the condemnation is still there. You can go to your pastor and you can talk to him and you can give him all those things that you've done. You can tell him who you are and what you are. But it doesn't change the condemnation that's there. You can talk to your husband or your wife. You can read self-help books and you can try to get over all this by yourself. Let me, let me go and read some of these wonderful, wonderful self-help books out there that will encourage me and strengthen me. I can go to meetings. I can go to church. I can go to church and sit there and listen to the preacher and get up and go out as hungry and as heavy hearted as I came in. Why? Why is that? 
because there's a condemnation there. There's something that's heavy. There's something that's draped over my soul. What is it? It's sin. And it has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with supernaturally. It's not done with man's games, man's plans, man's words. It's not done that way. And so we find that faith is the only method of deliverance from condemnation. Verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul said, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Hear this, to every one that thinks he's okay, to everyone that's followed in mom and dad's religion, to everyone that's been born a Jew, to everyone that's been in the holiness church, to everyone that says they're a Baptist. What are you talking about? It says, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Doesn't that change the picture right there, doesn't it, Brother Greg? Changes the picture right there. Whoa, 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 preacher, what are you talking about? I'm talking about faith. Faith is the only method of deliverance from condemnation. It's not faith in a man. It's not faith in a plan. It's faith in God. It's faith in God. What a wonderful thought this morning. And just doesn't pass through our head and our Mind, but oh, friends, it reaches way down deep into the depths of our souls and does something there. It does something way down deep in our souls. And so we see that faith is the only method of deliverance from the condemnation. When you come down here to pray and you don't have faith, you get up, go out just like you came in. There's no change. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of your heart and you go back out, you, it didn't do any good to come down here. It doesn't do any good for those things. But we must come to a place of where we recognize the condemnation is lifted. And how is it lifted? It's lifted by the blood of Jesus Christ, washing away every sin stain. Hallelujah forever. Excuse me for getting loud, but sometimes I need to wake you up. Secondly, faith brings purity of heart. Purity of heart. We find over there in verse 11 and 12, where Paul said, for I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. And you say, well, well, he was delivering to them. He was delivering them salvation. Yes, he was talking to them about being sanctified. He was talking to them about a greater gift, a spiritual gift. So how do you know? Because he'd already back, back prior to that in these verses that's prior to that, talked to them about their faith being worldwide. Everybody knew about the faith of the Romans. They were a tremendous church. That's why Paul had to write them a theological letter and not an encouragement letter, not a letter of direction, but one of theology that it could be able to help them to understand who they were and what they were by the power of Jesus Christ and what they could become by the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, he wanted to bring to them a spiritual gift. He wanted to help them to understand what it was all about. When you look over in the first Thessalonians chapter three, verse 13, he said he wanted to, to the end, he may establish their hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our father. Paul wanted to give them that spiritual gift, the uplifting, where Jesus said that the Holy Ghost would be with you and in you. He would direct your life. He would walk with you. He would talk with you. He'd be there wherever you might be. And when you walked with him and he talked with you, friends, there was a deep, deep 
fellowship. And Paul desired to give them this deep, deep fellowship. A lot of you don't understand the preaching of holiness. You haven't quite grasped the concept of it. But even those people that are not of our persuasion come to a place in their Christian life if they're truly following God where they recognize they need a deeper walk. There's something more they need. There's something in their heart that's lacking. And they begin to pray and ask God to do something mighty for them. And the blessed Holy Spirit comes down and fills them with himself. And gives them a blessed peace. They have life, but they have life more abundant. They have a death and a death under resurrection. They have a peace that's beyond understanding, you see. And so we find here that Paul wanted to impart to them this. You go on over in the chapter 6, 7, and 8 of Romans, and Paul gets into the theology of what happens to a man. How I want to do good, and I can't. Some of you do the same thing. You tell me that some of you... I want to be good. I want to really do right. I really do want to go this way. But there's just something there. And that's what Paul said. I want to do good, but I can't. That that I should do, I don't. And that that I shouldn't do, I do. What's he talking about? He's talking about there's something there that hinders that. There's something there that keeps you from serving God. There's something there that keeps you from having a depth in your experience. And so many people in the church world fight against it. Even preachers fight against it. And they want you to sin. They want you to go out and be a professing sinner Christian. They want you to do that. Did I say that right? They want you to be a sinning Christian. And you would think that even preachers would try their best to preach to you the truth that you can quit sinning, that you can have the power through the blessed Holy Spirit to be true and faithful to God. But even they get up and preach, you can't. Something wrong with that. And so I look back to this and say, well, maybe, maybe they're holding the truth and unrighteousness. Holding the truth and unrighteousness. I'm not going to really preach to you the truth. I'm just going to preach you what I think. If I preached to you what I thought, I'd probably talk to you about ice cream because I love ice cream. <laughs> but I don't eat it very often because you know it puts an ice cream cone right here. And some of you probably have got the ice cream cone too. Amen. Thank you. But we see, friends, I'm not going to preach to you what I think. I'm going to preach to you what it says. And sometimes what it says doesn't always go along with what we think. It doesn't always go along with what I think. And, and when it corrects my thinking, sometimes there's something on the inside that rises up and says, oh, that can't be right. No, no, no. You didn't say that right. Well, what did I say? What did God say? What did God's word say? Well, you know, preacher, that's not, that's really, really not the way I feel about it. Bless your heart. That's the southern way. Bless your heart. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter to any of us how we feel about it. There's some things in here that I read that just tear me up, so to speak. But I had to believe them because that's what God said. And my faith comes to a place where I want to be pure in heart. I want to walk before him with clean hands and a pure heart. I have a heart. A wicked, carnal heart that's deceitful above all things. And because it's deceitful, the Bible says, who can know it? Who can know it? Well, I've got to hurry on, don't I? Get you on down the line here so you can get to lunch. Sometimes the stomach's greater than the mind. But, number three, faith brings obedience. Faith brings obedience. 
verse 3, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Obedience, faith, obedience. Faith. So see, it's another facet of faith. You search the word and you find out what all the facets are and put them all together. You still wouldn't be able to build your house because you still wouldn't be able to get them all. You leave something undone. You leave something out. And so here he wants us to understand there is obedience about us. You know, when you have an unruly child, in the Old Testament you were supposed to take him out and stone him. Now, I wanted to do that to my boy a lot of times, you know, I can honestly say. And he knows that, so if he listens to this, he'll, he'll still know I wanted to do that to him. But my wife, she, you know, she was like the Holy Spirit, and she said, you don't need to do that. No, 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 just love him. Uh, love him. What are you talking about? Love him. Let's take him. But, no, seriously. Obedience sometimes is hard for us to come by. See, because we are men of our own youth are a man of your own. You don't need anybody to tell you what to do, do you? And you ladies are the same way. You're as carnal as men are sometimes. Not necessarily you three, but four, excuse me. But you find yourself in such a place, friends, that if you're careful, you become a disobedient individual and you tell God, I'm not gonna do what he says. I'm not gonna do what the word says because it doesn't fit in with my feelings. It doesn't feel in, fit in with my thought process. It doesn't feel, feel right to me. And why doesn't it feel right? Because you're carnal. Just hold on to sin. And so we see here that Paul says to us that this faith brings us into obedience. We can be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is who he is. And we want to be an obedient child our father now I'm sure some of you grew up you were just perfect little angels and you had gold on the tips of your wings I'm sure of that I can almost see it some of you and some of you you know had ash on the back of your wings I can see that too but here's the point regardless of what you do in the physical when you were a child it's a lot different than what you do in the spirit as you walk with the Lord. Do you think it's been easy for some Christians to walk with the Lord? Let's look just for a minute across the sea in China. The individuals over there have to worship in secret. They have to hide. They have to go into caves. They have to be able to go under, under other circumstances to, to gather together, just three or four of them and have a page out of the Bible, and read that page, and memorize that page, and when they get done with it, they pass it to another church, and another church passes them a page of the, the scriptures, so that they can read it, and study it, and memorize it, and write it for themselves. And that's all well and good, until, until, the Chinese government steps in, and begins to go after them follows them, has somebody to complain, a neighbor, because they have too many people in visiting them. And so they go in and they destroy the church. They martyr the individual. You say, well, that's a long time ago. No, that's happening today. We just don't hear it from China. Look what they're doing in Afghanistan now. They're taking the Christians out because they're Christians or because they supported a different government than what they're doing over there. And they're taking them out and they're killing them, beheading them, hanging. I saw yesterday where they hung an individual out in the court so all could see for the purpose of scaring individuals. We have it good here in America. Yet, it's coming. It's coming to us. We're seeing it little by little in the erosion of our Christian lives and our, our Christian experience. We're seeing little by little the erosion of our government encroaching over on these things. And are we going to be obedient? Are we going to be obedient to our government? Are we going to be obedient to God? Are we going to be obedient to our church? Are we going to be obedient to God? Or are we going to be obedient to the pastor who has changed his preaching style to the extent that he doesn't even preach the truth anymore. He preaches a falsehood in unrighteousness, the truth in unrighteousness. 
And so we see that faith brings obedience. Do you really want to come as a servant of Jesus Christ? That's the issue this morning. And then lastly, we find that faith gives us an earnest desire to grow in Christian grace. Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Those were the words that brought the Protestants out from underneath the Roman church. The just shall live by faith. And friends, we find this morning, if you and I are going to be able to grow, we have to have an earnest desire that we grow greater, that we be able to go farther in our Christian experience, that God can be able to move in your heart and your life so that as you walk with him, you experience something you've never experienced before. And you then are going to be able to go from faith to faith. You believe God. You can trust God. You can ask God for things that you never ever thought you should ask for or could ask for. And God will guide you through those means. Faith helps us to be able to grow in earnest desire in our Christian grace. If we don't grow, we become stunted, don't we? There are people in the physical world that do that. For whatever reason, there are some that do not grow. They don't grow very tall, and they don't get very big. And sometimes they can find out what the reason is physically that causes that, and sometimes they can't. But you know what? We see a 21st century church full of stunted Christians. Hmm. What happened? What happened? They began to follow the trends and the styles and the movements of their day and time and missed what God had for them to grow by. As much as you love ice cream, you won't grow just eating ice cream. You gotta have some meat and potatoes. Mm -hmm. You gotta have some bread, you gotta have some vegetables. You gotta have other things in your life to help your bones to grow, to help your mind develop, to help every part of you so that you will become a Christian and develop the way you should physically. And you've got to have all that spiritually. You've got to get off the milk. We still have a lot of stunted Christians in our church world that we're having to give a bottle to. Come on now. Come on now, honey. Come on. Let me give you some milk. Come on. Come on. Come on, Lance. Oh, let me. Come on. Open up. Open up. You know why? because you didn't want to graduate to the beat of the word. You didn't want to graduate to the beat of the word. And so we're seeing that people are not growing in their Christian graces. I don't want to be tested like that. I don't want to be in that situation. But as I told somebody last night, if you're put in that situation, Maybe somewhere down the road you're going to help somebody that's going to be in that situation too and you could tell them how you got out of it by God's grace. Everything that comes across our way helps me to help someone else down the road. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to grow with an earnest desire in the Christian faith, the graces that he gives to us so that we can be the Christian we need to be. But please, whatever you do, don't just keep on sucking on the bottle. Don't just keep on doing that. Finally get you a chicken bone and start gnawing on the end of it. That'll help you. That'll help you develop your teeth. That'll help you to focus to get that thing right there where it's supposed to be. And it'll give you a taste for the meat. And if you begin 
to get in God's word, you'll begin to get that chicken bone and you'll begin to gnaw on it and you'll begin to want more. Oh, please give me more. And pretty soon he gives you a little bit more until you graduate finally that steak and that big potato. Huh? You see what I'm saying? Too many times we're all content just to be where we are and be saddled with what we're doing. We don't want any more. But faith. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. And what is that? The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Let's stand for prayer. Now, I wouldn't dare ask any of you if you still feel like you're on the bottle. Would you be willing to come down and lay it on an altar? Because I know that would be embarrassing to you. I'm a man. Yes, you may be. But what about your heart? Amen. What about your heart? Is it right before God? Is your heart right before God? This is the greatest gift that God has given to us. This side of heaven is his son. To die for you and to die for you and to die for you and to die for me. But what are we going to do, friends? Turn it aside one more time because I'm not ready. So when will you be ready? When will you be ready? What will it take to get you ready? What will it take to move you? My of the Lord. Our Father, as we bow before you this morning, we pray that that which we've said would strike home, make some of the fellows so miserable they just can't hardly eat or sleep or rest or anything else, but they don't think about this message. Or think about their heart and their life where it is before you. Lord, we're glad this morning we had an opportunity to sow some seed. There'll be somebody come along somewhere and water that seed. There'll be somebody else that'll come along somewhere and hopefully reap that seed. Yes. And we pray this morning that you would help every man that's here and every woman, dear Lord, if they're not right and they haven't experienced the grace that you have for us, that they'll begin to press the matter and not waste time. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen.